Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming along. So I'm John, I'm an analyst at the University of Edinburgh, which might seem like a long way to come down, but when I heard that BAV routinely gets hundreds and hundreds of people for this community, I was like, sign me up. I did take a week to decide, but you'll forgive me that. But I'm really, really chuffed to be here um, with all of you. I'm going to share some ideas. I'm going to try not to ram products down your throat. Um, so let me start. This is where we are, and I believe we're just here under this crap logo. No offence, BAF. The topic for tonight is a surprise. And I'm going to give you some clues. So let's just fade this map, and I'm going to show you the topic. Now, if anyone knows what these are, I'm going to ask you to not shout out because it's going to spoil the fun for everyone else. And I'm going to give you some clues, five clues. Here is the first one. Number one. Clue two. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> the third clue, you go here. Has anyone got any ideas yet? Don't worry if not. We've got half an hour. Number four, according to the Ordnance Survey, they're not PC anymore. It's political correctness gone mad. And clue number five, you spend here, but sometimes it's free. Has anyone got any ideas? This is an interactive session. Yes. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> As in prêt à manger. No, much too cultured. Yes, lady in the front. Oh my goodness me, did everyone hear that? Public toilets. Correct. Whoa. We are here tonight to discuss public toilets. <laughs> now let me just go to that PC thing. It's true, the Ordnance Survey have actually revised their map symbols for the 1 to 25,000 maps. They used to say PC, which is public convenience. You might also see WC, water closet. Toilet talk is full of euphemisms. They actually had a competition, and some guy, this guy here on the right, he won it to devise a new logo for Luz on Ordnance Survey maps. And that was run with The One Show, which I thought was amusing, because what if they called it The Number One Show? <laughs> it would be a whole different ball game. It was also a little bit ironic, because the Ordnance Survey had devoted no fewer than six symbols to water sports. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So, my inspiration, um, one evening I was cruising the internet and I came across <laughs> this data set. I was looking for open source data for the crap talk, not open source data, which again would be something completely different. So let's stick with open source. Uh, I wanted some data that I could analyze, I could download, we could manipulate, and it just seemed like the right theme for a crap talk. So I hope you'll humor and forgive me for this topic. Um, Yes, tonight is all about toilets, but I guess you're all analysts, you work with data, customers, stores, so everything that I'm going to show you is directly analogous to what an analyst might use. So embrace the theme, but don't lose sight of what you might do with your data in the coming time. Now, when you see great British toilet maps, I was thinking this was toilets in Britain that were great. And you might have seen there's actually a Loo of the Year awards. They meet for a very jolly session in December and they share all that's great about public loos. So maybe I thought it was about that kind of greatness. And then I thought maybe it's about famous toilets. Now, this is a good example. These are the Victorian toilets in Rothsey in the Isle of Bute in Scotland. And they're actually a visitor attraction. They've got their own TripAdvisor page. <laughs> and I found out at the weekend that my parents have been here, and my dad actually took my mum into the gents' loo to see it, which you can do if there's no gents doing their business at the time. So I wondered if it was this kind of greatness. Um, these were actually built in 1899, about 50 years after the Great Exhibition of 1851, which is where the first public loos really came to be, where people would spend a penny, literally, to, to go there, the first flushing toilet. So there's a lot of history. It can tell us a lot about the culture of Victorian times. These were facilities for men. Um, at the time, it was much harder for women to actually find a public loo, and consequently, the public sphere was a male place women had to figure out quite carefully where they would stop off in their days. So, from a cultural point of view, quite profound. And in fact, if anyone wants to learn more on the topic, I highly recommend The Big Necessity, The Unmentionable World of Human Waste. And there's one particular quote that I think is worth sharing. To be uninterested in the public toilet is to be uninterested in life. 
<laughs> so there you go. So it transpires that this is about all toilets. It's a crowdsourced data set. The, the data comes from councils, from businesses, um, from OpenStreetMap, if you've heard of that, and from any member of the public. They can go in and edit toilets, and they can suggest them. So that comes with its risks. If we click on one particular example, um, you can see some attributes along the left. So there's opening times, there might be costs, if that data is available. But crucially, down there on the bottom left, there's a little link that says JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. Basically, JSON is a whole bunch of text which the computer can read. So once I saw that, I thought, right, here's the hook, here's our data. We can grab it all and do something with it. Now, I was thinking of giving you a demo of what I do to, you know, how I, I actually do this in the software. And I don't think we're going to have time. If we've got any time later, I will build you my public glue example. It'll take about five minutes. Um, I use a piece of software called Altrix. I'm interested, have any of you guys used it or heard of it? A few. So Altrix. John doesn't work for Altrix. <laughs> I don't work for Altrix, and that's why I don't want this to be about Altrix. But suffice it to say, um, all my examples were built with Altrix in, well, it, it would be a lie to say I'd done them all in minutes, but keep an eye out for this software because if you're messing around in Python, R, SQL, Excel, Altrix is the kind of thing that once you start to use it, you'll wonder how you ever went back. And I'll maybe follow this up with a blog post as well. So this is my module. Basically, it's code-free analytics. I bring in that URL. I pass all about 15,000 toilets, um, filter the data, manipulate it, transpose it, cross-tab, and provide it into something useful, which is a map. So that's all I'm going to say for now about Altrix. But by all means, come and talk to me about, uh, about it at the end. It's an incredible piece of software. So I took all those loos. And oddly, well, most of them are in Britain, some are in France, and some are dotted around the world, which is strange for the British toilets. Um, and that just goes to show when you crowdsource data, you can't control everything. Some of these might have been geocoded wrong, but, you know, it's nice to have some international appeal. <laughs> With that risk come some added benefits. You can get some honest takes. So here are a few of my favorite descriptions in the properties field. Built in 23, the tall arch-back urinals and tiled old-fashioned cubicles give any user a sense of privacy, which I thought was a relief. A wonderful example of a 1930s Agatha Christie, whodunit interior. Now, in my view, whodunit is a slightly awkward choice of terminology when discussing <laughs> public toilets. But hey-ho. Ask to use their facilities under the guise you're a guest. Ensure you are smartly dressed. Good advice for anyone. Fabulous location, but look out for the spider's webs. No local council will give you that kind of advice. Functional, a little al fresco. <laughs> and my favorite, police hid out here before foiling a robbery at the adjacent HSBC bank in 2007. <laughs> okay, so this is crowdsourced useful data, so I'm, I'm trying to embrace that. So I took the data from the JSON format, I passed it, I geocoded the latitude and longitude, and I have a map here, almost 10,500 Great British Loos. The snag here is that we've got a wide screen, and the UK is kind of oriented north-south, so I wonder if I could take a liberty here and shove the country on its side. Now, I've been getting used to this idea over the last four days. To you, it's probably going to look pretty weird. Cornwall is now really far away from London. Um, by contrast, some bits coast-to-coast, coast, like if you're doing a coast-to-coast coast bike ride, it suddenly looks a lot more <coughs> achievable. For me, personally, the west coast of Scotland looks suddenly within reach, whereas before it was always miles away. The reason I do this is because I want to make better use of the screen, but actually it's worth thinking about perspective. This is the blue marble um, taken by the crew of Apollo 17 as they hurtled towards the moon, for the last time, actually. Um, and it's quite a... It's probably one of the most widely distributed images ever. It was the first time we saw Earth from this perspective fully lit. And I think this really spawned something of an environmental awareness about the beauty and fragility of our planet. Except the thing is, they didn't see it like that. They saw it like this. The attitude of their spacecraft, the position of the person looking out the window, they saw the world upside down. Although, really, once you're out of orbit, there is no upside down. Antarctica is at the top. But to us, it just looks a bit wrong. It looks unweighted. I look at Africa down there, and it doesn't make sense. So that's just perspective. If I move it back, it's almost like the South Pole is pulling us back into shape. 
but we could look at these maps any way we want. So the point there is don't get too disheartened by this. So I took all the loos and I plotted them in a slightly smaller font. Um, and what we can do is we can create a density surface um, which really shows one main thing, which is London. And London, where we are right now, it has more of everything, more jobs, more cars, more homeless people, more um, houses, more pressure. London, it's where it's at. And for me, as an Edinburgh resident, that's quite exciting. But perhaps I can show you that data in a slightly different way. If I click there, try again, one more time. OK, here we go. So these are our loos shown in perspective. We're just looking at the density of public toilets. And as you can see, London absolutely stands out a mile. There are lots of pockets in other places, um, but let's not lose sight of that perspective. So to make it a bit fairer, we need to understand where the people are. So I've plotted every postcode in the UK here in light blue. There's about a million and a half of them. So in terms of data, this is mildly taxing, but it doesn't take very long with all tricks. Oops, did I just say that? We have over 60 million people. Now, this is from the 2000, uh, 2011 census, so it's not perfect. I could have used more up-to-date data, but for our purposes, it works just fine. Then let's add in the loos. We've got about 10,500 of those. And if I divide the number of people by the number of loos, we get this hitherto unknown figure, 5,844 people per loo. Did you know that? <laughs> no. Will you remember it? It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's our baseline. So data people are always thinking about their target population and the baseline. So this, for, the, for Great Britain, is our base. And let's split that by country. So in England, we've got 6,031 PPL. It's my new unit, people per loo. <laughs> Wales, 5,190. And Scotland comes out in the lead, as it were, with 4,720. So quite different distribution there. And we can look at a quick table to try and make sense of it all. Have I got a laser on here? Yeah, but it's flashing. Great. <laughs> what you see here is that England has the most loos by far and the most population. But look at that ratio. So it has 84% of the loos, but, only, but rather 86% of the population. So it's slightly uneven there. And that's why the ratios are slightly different in Scotland and Wales. Basically, there's fewer people for the same amount of loos. So we can take that and express it as a slightly different ratio. This time, I'm going to do loos per million people. So England has fewer, Scotland has more. And if we divide that measure by the national baseline, we can compute something called an index. So indices are quite useful for very quickly looking at the data and saying, where is it in relation to the norm? England is slightly under-indexed, so it's got a value less than 100, whereas Scotland is over-indexed, not by a huge amount, but by enough that we can see, right, what's going on here. So take that idea of the index, less than 100, more than 100, and we'll apply that to some different areas. But first of all, a little bit of light relief. <laughs> Has anyone seen this before? It's by an Italian Photoshop art artist called Cristina Guggeri. Um, I hope it hasn't upset anyone. <laughs> right, back to the serious stuff. So you looked at the whole country. We've looked at the England, Scotland, Wales. Does anyone know what kind of units, geographical areas these are? They're not counties. Someone said a C word, constituencies. Yes, these are Westminster parliamentary constituencies. And what we can do, we can take all those postcodes and all the loo points and we can mesh them together quite simply and produce an index map like this. So anything red or orange is under-indexed, which means they have fewer loos per population. Anything green is over-indexed. And yeah, the map is on the side, and it does take some getting used to, but what you can see, there's pockets of red, North London, Lincolnshire, um, Cheshire, South Wales, especially around Glasgow. So these are perhaps slightly more deprived communities, some of them. Um, so we tend to find fewer loos per unit of population. Whereas if you look at some of those dark greens, these are much more remote, possibly wilder, certainly less populated areas. So again, if I were a company selling to the whole of the UK, I would want to say, show me my picture. Where am I doing well? Where am I not? Let's look at the demographics. That's absolutely fundamental to any business. And yet many people are put off that because actually 
grinding the data is quite difficult. So if we take all of those, 632, and plot them by index. So index is the vertical axis, and I've just ordered them along the horizontal axis from small to big. And what we find here, when we look at the 100 mark, is that there's some inequality. We've got 408 constituencies, that's about two-thirds that are under-indexed, whereas we have about 224, about a third, which are over-indexed. And you can see some green bars shooting up to the right. So that's places where they've got loads and loads of lose relative to their population. So as a geographer, inequality is inherently interesting. If everything looked the same, there'd be nothing really to learn. So I wanted to look, first of all, at the left end of that scale. There are actually seven constituencies that don't have any public lose, according to this data. A couple in Glasgow, a few in Yorkshire, and um, Birmingham. Now, guess which party, which constituency, the MPs for these areas might be? Any guesses? Well, I've heard virtually all the main parties there, so <laughs> good effort. Probabilistically, you're right on the money. Six of them are Labour, and one Conservative. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll think about whether this is fair or not, but it, I feel like it's notable. <laughs> so hold that thought, and then let's look to the other end of the scale, where we're looking at the most index. So these are the ones with the most lose per population. And if we look at the, the constituencies, London and Westminster is way out in the lead. Um, then we've got, well, let's have a look. These two are conservative. Then we've got Orkney, Caithness, Westmoreland, uh, Lib Dem. Rosca and Loch Arbor and Nahiananyar, that's Scottish Gaelic for the Western Isles. They're SNP, surprise, surprise. And I'm not sure about this one, Dwyff or Merioneth? Any Welsh speakers? Yes, Dwyff or Merioneth. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Ply Cymru, so no Labour. Now, whether that's statistically significant, I don't know, but I thought it was worth plotting. Now, it's yes, it might not tell you that much. When we put the two side by side, you might say the Labour ones are very densely populated, they're smaller, therefore there's a, good, there's a better chance they might just not have any lose as a function of their size. Equally, these other places, um, perhaps they have a different demographic, they might have an older population, they might have more visitors. We're looking at baseline population, we should be looking at daytime population or tourists or whatever. Again, I'm not trying to publish this work on lose. I'm just trying to show you some analysis and to make the point that you and your company and your team could or should be doing this for yourselves. So if we can get the uh, MPs for a handful, I thought we could get the MPs for them all. Have you heard of this site called They Work For You? So you can go on there, there's loads of places where you can retrieve a list of MPs. So again, a really short Altrix module just to pull off that data on the top part, and then the bottom part is my boundaries for Westminster constituencies. I mash them together in a join, which is about a million times easier than trying to do it in SQL or trying to do a VLOOKUP or an index and match. Basically, we're just fusing data together. It couldn't be easier. And what we get is this. Everyone will have seen a map like this. Lots of blue, a little bit of red, lots of yellow in Scotland. Perhaps not that significant as an election map. But what's interesting is when we plot the Lou indices. So this is a histogram, OK? I'm not plotting counts here. I'm plotting a kind of normalized frequency. So we've got the conservative graph there and compare that to the labor graph beneath. Now, the fact that there's more conservative constituencies versus fewer Labour ones, that's OK, because we've actually everything under here adds up to 100%. You can see the Labour distribution is definitely shunted to the left, and it has lots more under-indexed constituencies, whereas the conservative one, quite positively distributed, a long tail, lots of over-indexed places with relatively lots of lose. Again, that to me was relatively striking. I don't think it's going to change anything, but it was a pattern that it was worth mapping and worth graphing. As, an as analysts, we ought to enjoy that kind of stuff. I obviously do, perhaps a little bit too much. And there is our center point. OK, so that's all, uh, that's all fairly interesting. Let's have a word association game. What's this? What do we call? a collection of numbers. Data. data. This is data, OK? Singular or plural? 
It's kind of a bit of both. Old school people will say, well, data is the plural of datum, therefore the data are this, the data aren't that. I think these days everyone's treating it as singular. It's like saying agendum instead of agenda. It depends how pernickety or pretentious you want to be. So I'm going to go singular and Tamandra Harkness, who's written a really interesting book on big data, she also says it should be singular. What's this? A cube. Good. Therefore, what's this? A data cube. So that's quite a common term for people that are doing data warehouses or databases. If that's a data cube, what's this? It's a smaller one. What's another word for small? Mini. Mini. Easier than that. Starts with an L. Little. Now, what do toddlers say instead of little? Ickle. Ickle. So this is an ickle data cube. Hold that thought. What's this? This is a cube ickle. Okay. And what's this? Cube ickle data. Okay. So you've got an ickle data cube and cube ickle data. So let's bring it back to our local area. Um, we've looked at the national scene. I want to bring it back to where we are because this is where we can really get into the nitty-gritty of the spatial stuff. So we've got a bunch of loos, and these are real-life public toilets around us. And we've got a bunch of population. So these are postcodes, and I know how many people live at each postcode. And again, let's not get into the residential daytime debate. Just treat them as people. What I can do is draw a radius around every loo. And this one is 150 meters. And I can say anyone within that, they're kind of in our catchment. Anyone who's out with that distance, they're kind of lost to us. And then it's very easy to, to work out the numbers. So let's drop out the map so we can see clearly. And then we can produce a graph of the population in, the population out. So many more people are outside of our catchments here, which might be a problem. We can then look at how many of those catchments overlap. So I don't know how many of you are involved in spatial side of things. It used to be that to do this you had to have a master's degree in GIS, Geographic Information Systems. Nowadays everyone does spatial. You don't need special training or special skills. Uh, and the audience survey, they say things happen in places. Everything happens somewhere. So if you've got a geographic component to your data, whether that's a postcode, whether you have physical stores, and you're not using that, then definitely think about whether you should be. Even if you're an online business, if you think that geography doesn't matter, I suspect it probably does. If you start to map your customers, your suppliers, I suspect you'll find relationships. So what we're doing here is just some basic spatial logic. We have overlapping catchments here, and then what we can do is we can work out how many times they're overlapping. So some of these locations, they could potentially be serviced by multiple loos. And that's when it gets really interesting, because if these were customers, what you're looking at is various competitors or competing organizations. So you might have to work really hard for those customers down in the bottom right, whereas the ones in the top who are only near one particular outlet, they might have no other choice. So we can take that and do the maths. We've got about 17,000 people in this catchment, and 11,000 of them don't have access to any loo, according to our definition. A bunch of them have access to one loo, about 5,000. Some of them are within the catchment of two loos, about 788. And then finally, there's some who are within the catchment of three, about 111. And we can look at the way that distribution drops off quite dramatically from one, zero, one, two, three. Now, imagine you're a politician. So let's come back to politics. And someone says, oh, we've been looking at your constituency. And well over half, in fact, two thirds, don't have access to any public conveniences. That's not going to be good for you. So what would a politician do? There's two answers here. A good politician would say, right, we need to build some more loos. Or if they're a geographically inclined politician, they might look at that dense network down there and say, this isn't optimized. We should close some of these because they're covering it. They're redundant. We should move that resource and open some new ones. And again, people do this with stores routinely. In fact, any of the big re retailers, 
they have huge location planning departments, and most of them will be using Ultrix. Oops, I said it again, sorry. So Ultrix is used for a lot of geographic optimization, whether that means adding stores or closing them or modeling both and running millions of scenarios and seeing which ones come out best. We don't have time to discuss that, and we don't have time to do the right thing. So what else could a politician do to make things look better? Well, they could change the goalposts. So instead of having a 150 meter radius, and again, these are simple circles. If we had more time, we'd look at the road networks. We do walk times. We could use the Google API to work out the actual time in minutes rather than for some kind of idealized plane. This would work for a desert, um, but it doesn't work where there's houses and roads and rivers and obstacles. They would say, well, can you just increase the radius a bit and run it again? Can you do it for 200 meters, 250? So each time we increase this chunk of area, you can see the gray ones at the top, we're slowly bringing them into play. So this is the kind of lazy approach. We just change the boundaries. We plot bigger and bigger and bigger catchments until, now there's still two more gray ones. Once we get up to 600 meter radius, we've covered them all. So potentially a politician would say, what are you talking about? All of my constituents live within 600 meters of a public toilet, problem solved. That's one way of looking at it. And because I've modeled those in quite discrete 50 meter chunks, I ran a little batch macro to model them in one meter chunks. And this is what you get. So you start at zero, the radius is along the bottom. You start at zero meters and go all the way up to 600. Along the left is the percentage of our population who are covered. So that's the population in, and this is the population at. As you'd expect, they mirror each other. So we've got in on the right, out on the left. And this is quite interesting because there's a kind of moment of truth at 189 meters. That's this radius size at which point if you keep increasing it, more of your population are within your zone than are out with it. So that would be an interesting point. Finally, at the far right, 567 meters is the exact radius it would take to include all your population. Now that might be a bit extreme. You might be accused of fudging the numbers. A reasonable person might optimize it around 312 meters, which if you look along the intersection of that gray line is 75%. So you could say with that radius, 75% of my constituents are within this zone. Again, this doesn't change anything on the ground. We're not actually improving facilities or services. We're just putting some spin on how we present them, which is something that politicians love to do. And backed up with a little bit of analysis, you can kind of bring it to life. Um, so I spend a lot of time making maps and graphs and playing out different scenarios. But I always think spatially, and I suppose that's one of my big points today. So let's bring back the original map of public toilets. The point, as I made earlier, this isn't really about the loos. They were just a vehicle to explore some, some ideas. So, so thank you for indulging me with your attention. Um, do come and talk to me if you're interested, if you're not currently using your spatial data, either because of the constraints of actually wrangling and prepping and blending that data, or because you just don't know how. And some of you will be way ahead of others in this. So if you've got some tips for me, then by all means come and speak to me. As I said before, I'm very happy to talk about alt tricks as well, just because that enables everything I do. It gives me a system and a methodology to solve problems, which as analysts, um, that's surely the, the greatest fun. I hope there's fun in your jobs. There's certainly fun in my job, and that's through solving problems. So these loos are just an example, but really this talk is about geographic insight, and if this has helped to, to let you look at your data in a slightly different way, then hopefully that will, that will be enough for me. Otherwise, that's 29 minutes, so I think I'm done. Thank you very much.